less important. Nevertheless, you still have to learn this material. And so I was surprised by how poorly the class as a whole did on that last question. But let's just go through this and talk about it. I want you to know and understand the right answer so that when you see it again, you're going to know what to put. That's the hope of the So the true false questions were only one point each. I will probably beat those up next time. At any rate, assembly language code is machine independent. Well, no, that's not true. What is assembly language? These are mnemonic symbols for the actual uh, instruction set of a given chip. Any given chip has a certain set of instructions that is built in. They're hard coded. And so the assembly language is exactly that set of instructions. So there is no other platform that is enti as entirely dependent on the machine as the assembler. So this is not just wrong. All right, risk, reduced in sec instruction set chip or computer, true. Risk chips have fewer instructions than CIS chips. So are those terms clear you guys? You know what they are. Risk chip is reduced instruction set. You know, in the 1980s, when we started getting better compilers, the designers realized that much of the difficulty in making great compilers was the instruction set we were using was overly complicated. What worked well for humans uh, did not necessarily work well for machines. So having a streamlined set of instructions, knowing that no one would write an assembler, everyone would use a compiled language on that platform, they could get better optimizing compilers. Um, those chips are by and large gone now, except for special few circumstances. Uh, basically, Intel has kind of gone away with the market. And they are CISC, or complex instruction set chips. All right, assemblers are more complex than compilers. No, compilers are more complex than assemblers. An assembler takes assembly language statements and translates it to object code. What does a compiler do? It takes a higher level language and translates it to object code. What you end up with is essentially the same, whether you're starting in C++ or you're starting in assembler. Well, the translation from C++ to machine instruction far more complex than assembly language or assembler to machine language. Okay, the next one. Encoding an assembly language instruction using the actual physical memory address instead of a displacement makes the program easier to relocate. And no, this is not true. Why is this not true? Why is this not true? If you encode it with a displacement, what's involved for relocation? Nothing. Nothing at all. So some of you got the addresses wrong on that last question, but you still have the right instruction. Why is that? Because the distance from point A to point B within a program is consistent. So if you're encoding an instruction with the actual address, say that, for instance, if you load this in a different place in memory, then you have to go in and change the object. Oh, you have to change that actual instruction. And this happens at the time when you load the program because you don't know what the address is going to be until you actually start to run it. So you have a program and in the object code, the compiled or assembled code, you have hard-coded addresses and they all have to be changed because this won't work. 
However, if you have encoded this in the form xxx006, uh, zero, zero, for instance, that just says from where you're at right now, go forward six bytes, and it has nothing to do with the address. So any place you put this in memory, it works, and you don't have to touch it. But this one, you have to go in and actually change that number. Suppose you loaded address 3000 in hex. Well, then this address is not right, because if it starts at 3000, this certainly isn't in the range of your program. Does everybody understand this? A lot of you missed it. I was surprised by that. OK. The pound sign before a label in the operand field is always an error opcode field contains the symbol directly. I suppose what threw you was the always. But that's true. That's true. Is that okay? okay. Yeah, that's fine. Of course it is. That's the immediate mode. Well, what about this? Is that okay? No, it's an error. Well, what about alpha e to u pound sign beta? Okay, or is it an error? Error. It's an error. Alpha word. Is that okay? No, it's an error. It's an error. Hmm. Well, in all those cases, we mean the address of data, don't we? Aren't all of these the address of data? But this one, this one, and this one, these are assembler directives, base, e to u, word. They're assembler directives, not instructions. Why is the pound sign not okay there? Can't tell if you're bored or you don't know the answer. Who doesn't know? Okay, brave souls, thank you for raising your hands. It's helpful for me not to put you on the spot, but to help me understand what where we are. Okay. What is this? What is this? Pound sign in it's an address. Well, where does the addressing mode have any relevance? Only with assembly language instructions. It's an addressing mode. Well, what's meant by addressing mode? Pound sign alpha. Pound sign two. Those are immediate mode. At alpha. Well, could we do this? No. Silly. Why not? Because it's an addressing mode. The addressing mode is only applicable to machine instruction. The machine instructions, of course, aren't in play when the assembler runs. And assembler directives are gone when you create the object code. What's left? in the executable or object code from that declaration after the assembler has finished it. Nothing. What does this generate in output to the object file? Nothing. Zero. If this address is 0, 0, 1, 2, 3, then what's this address? Same thing. Yes. 
same thing. It takes no space. Right? So the idea here of addressing modes, how do you get to the data? How do you access the data? It doesn't even apply if the machine isn't running, if the program isn't running, it's irrelevant. The addressing mode is how you get to something. So the assembler directives don't have those. What can I put in front of data here that makes any sense? Alpha word thing. Nothing. There's nothing you can put in front of this if it's not applicable. Only machine instructions. LPA, LPB, whatever it might be. That's where the addressing mode is applicable. Does that kind of make sense? You with me? Okay. Program counter refers to a variable that is used during the assembly process. No, it doesn't. What's the program counter? It's a register that's in the CPU. Can you access that during assembly time? No. It's a runtime thing. Understand this big difference between runtime and assembly time. Now, of course, if you're on that platform, the PC is available to the assembler. But in terms of the program, you can't access the registers until runtime. That's why we did this. Some of you seem confused by it, and I hope you're okay with why we're doing it now. But we see something like base, alpha, and then L, B, B, down sign, alpha. Well, why do we have to do this twice? Can't the uh, instructions just read the base register? Well, the base register is not available to runtime. It's not available during assembly time. It's a very different concept, assembly time versus runtime. <coughs> this directive is used when? It's assembly time. When you're assembling the program, you have this base directive. And so in your program, you have a variable. Maybe you've called it base. And the value in base is the address of alpha. So that you can calculate the offsets. Knowing that when the program actually runs, then this is going to load into B register. But when you're assembling the program, can you read the B register? No, you can't. Not available till runtime. So there's a big difference between assembly time and runtime. Questions? Okay. So what do you use to keep track of where you're at during assembly? <coughs> location counter. It's the location counter. Exactly. Okay, an example of a forward reference is a label in an operand field that has not yet been defined. Is that a forward reference? Yes, it is. There is a memory reference, and you haven't encountered it yet, so you don't know what it is that's undefined. So that's a forward reference. Assemble table. This is a really important idea, assemble table. This is used to, to store user-defined symbols in a program. What are user-defined symbols? Labels. Labels. Can you just, uh, or do they always have to be labels? Do they have to exist somewhere as a label? You know, if I say who, Legal statement, yes. But there's an implication here that bar is defined somewhere as a label. Because if it's not, then what is the meaning of bar? Who knows what it is? So if it's a forward reference, then you have bar down here somewhere. If it's not a forward reference, but a backward reference, then we could have this.
Does this make sense? Sure it does. All right, but it's bar a label, yes. So it's defined something as a label. It's also user-defined symbols. Normally with user-defined symbols, the value of the symbol is its address. If you have alpha word eight, alpha has an address here. In this case, you have this symbol table, the sim tab, and in it you have alpha and its value, which is its address, with equates. You don't give them the address, rather you give them the value, because in this example here, Bar and food have the same addresses. Does everybody see why this is so? Maybe counterintuitive, but it's nevertheless true that if this address is uh, 0A, let's say, so is this. Well, what moves the address forward? If you have a machine <coughs> instruction, if you have a format 3 instruction, you add 3. A format 4 instruction, you add 4. Well, what's the format for bar and food? There isn't one. These guys have the same address. They have the same address. So their value is set manually with each point. So you have bar. And this value is 8. And you have foo. And this value is 8. <coughs> this makes sense? So these are heavily used. The assignment I just gave my students in 237. I just gave them this assignment. They just turned it in last Thursday. But they had this. They had a data file. Data. DQU. 6000. A. DQU. Data. B. C, B, Q, U, B plus 2. So they had A through F and X, Y, Z. So it's like 8 or 9 numbers. So how much space does that take up in the object code, in the executable program? None, it takes down. The CPU doesn't know what a C is. Wherever a C exists, it will be replaced by the value. So this is 6,000, 6,002, 6,004. So where C exists, the assembler will replace it with 6,004. There you go. So this is the idea of a simple table and user-defined symbols. These are always, always labels that the user has written somewhere in the program. Those are user-defined symbols. If they are to label somewhere, then they're not legal. Okay. Assembler directives do not generate any object code. Not true. Not true. Some of them do. Some of them do. generate anything in the object code? The answer is yes, it does. It generates the word and it's a constant. But that goes in the actual object code. So yes, sometimes the symbol directives do generate object code. Okay, if the SICXE opt code has a plus in front of it, it means the instruction must be encoded using format full or false. 
that's true. The at symbol may be placed in front of a memory reference operand, in which case it means that the memory location contains an address that must be dereferenced. And that is the definition of that term. That's exactly right. The next one, the pound sign symbol or hashtag. We had the pound sign long before there were hashtags. At any rate, the pound sign symbol can never appear in the operand field. Not true. Not true. LDB pound sign delta, for instance, is perfectly acceptable. In an assembly language statement, the pound sign in front of the label means the value of that label. Does it? Some of you wrote false and then left me a little note. It means the address. Guess what? The value of the label is the address. <coughs> what is the value of alpha? The address of alpha. This is the symbol table idea. If you think symbol table, you can't miss it. There is a symbol and it has a value. Usually it's the address unless you use the Q, in which case it is the manually assigned value. All right. If n equals 1 and i equals 1, it means the address in both mode is both indirect and immediate. No, it doesn't. You can't have anything that's both indirect and immediate. That's an impossible mode. Format 1 can never have an operand. True. I know they teach you like grade school or high school when you're taking tests. Any, any question that says never is probably false. That's not always true. <laughs> a format 1 opcode can't have an operand. It's impossible, so never is applicable. All right. No object code is generated by the processing of a byte or word assembly directly. And it's not true, as we just said. If the starting address for an SICXE program is 0, then the program cannot be relocated. False. 0 means it can be relocated. The PC relative addressing mode does not allow negative offsets. Wrong. If you have a loop, you've got to go back to the top of the loop. You need a negative offset. Instructions that use base relative mode are more difficult to relocate than format 4 instructions. That's just another way of saying the question that was on the other page. Base relative mode instructions don't have to be changed to be relocated. You don't have to do any work. However, if you have the hard-coded address that you have in format 4, then you must. Indirect mode cannot be used with an immediate value, and that's also true. All right, next question. All right, so let me down fairly quickly here. N is 0 and I is 0 on the first one. That's impossible. That's impossible. Why is it impossible? Well, if it's neither indirect nor immediate, then they're both set to 1. So that one's invalid. The second one, it's got both PC and base modes checked. Well, you can't encode it with both sets. It's one or the other. They're mutually exclusive. The next one, indirect and the X bit, the index. And that's impossible. The next three are valid. The next to the bottom one, NIX. Is that OK? Yes. How about NIXB? Is that OK? Yes, it's OK. You have NIXB or P is OK. Absolutely, it's both out three. The E is not compatible. You can't have P and E or B and E. If you have E, then B and P must be zero. But it's format four 
You're not encoding an offset in either PC or base relative mode. So if the E from format 4 is set, then those have to be zero. Now I have one more question before we move on from this. Is it possible to have E zero and PC and base relative also zero? Next question. So this was worth a lot of points. There are way more mistakes than I expected. And I gave you a little example here of thinking this is going to be easier to look at. So there are five errors on this page. There are five of them. So string str equals a thick brown fox jumped over the fence. Ended with a period. Semi I was hoping that was obvious. <laughs> Most of you got that. The vector B. This will not compile. It will not compile because where are the angle brackets and the type? So this will not compile. You can't, you can't do it. So this had to have string in it. The next one. This last POS and POS, all right, we're kind of camel case, and that's my fault. I probably shouldn't have used camel case, but I did. But it's not an error. This code, by the way, came off the class website. So you can't really say, oh, I tricked you by showing you something you've never seen before. This was on the class website, and we talked about it in class, so I think it is fair. So, okay, that's two. Error number three in the while if we have v dot pushback, that's not how you spell pushback. And every single one of you that wrote code for this project, for project one, used pushback. At least I think you could. So it's push underscore lowercase back. That's a mistake. All right, the functions in there are fine. There's nothing wrong with them. That's three errors. The fourth error, the C out statement, the angle brackets go the wrong way. The angle brackets go the wrong way. That's for input, not output. And the last error, there's an extra bracket that doesn't match anything. So there are too many close brackets. So there were five errors. It was 10 points each. Uh, Many of you flagged things that you thought were wrong but really were not wrong. If it wasn't a serious matter, I didn't take off points, so I reserved the right to do that. I think all of you got the fourth question. Only a couple of people uh, had mistakes in those. And then this last page. All right. So I'm not going to go through this whole thing and take the entire hour, but I want to take, talk about some of the things you missed. What is the first thing that has an address that's not zero? The LVB is the first thing that has an address that's not zero. No. Well, the line that says begin gets the address from the start declaration. But the next line also has the same address. So going down here with P, you have either a zero or a dash, it wouldn't matter. You have start 1,000. Next line is 1,000. Now this is base down. Well, that's not critical, critical. Because the address again is not going to be stored, not, not there. Right? So gamma is a forward reference, and it's going to be looked up later. So the address of this isn't stored anymore. Same address. 
And this is the plus LTV. And the next instruction. Now, a lot of you had address zero. I'm not sure where that came from. It says start 1000. So that's the starting address is 1000. All right. The address of alpha is what? Minus 1000. Yes. And then beta because alpha declares one word, three bytes. Now the one a bunch of you missed. What's the address again? It's plus three thousand in hex. Plus 3,000. Now I put the dollar sign in maybe in the hex to make this easier, not tricky. If some of you went converted, you just add 3,000 in hex. So it's, it's all in hex, you just add it to me. Okay, your last address, the last line. So I thought this was an easy question. That part. What was confusing about it? I mean, you knew this was going to be on the test, right? You knew it. So, okay. I'm going to ask you this again because there were so many mistakes. So you can count on being asked this again. I know, oh joy. <laughs> All right. So there was no real pattern here in terms of the machine instructions of which there were five of them. Usually if somebody missed one, they missed all of them. Now if this seemed unfair, this is there are five of these, there were two points each. So it would have been minus ten points if you missed all of the encoding questions and you got the addresses right and the storage allocation directions right. That would have been you only lost ten points. Unfortunately that's kind of not So, um, as I said, I'm not going to repeat what we've done in class several times in terms of the encoding. If you have questions about how these are encoded, please ask me. I will show you. I'd be happy to go through it with you very carefully. I said, let's do just one of them, shall we? Let's do just one of them. Let's do J again. Yeah. J again. All right, so looking at my notes here, I can see that this is so is it uh, 32? Is that the right code? Let's see. Yeah, 3C. 3C, okay, same difference. That's not too bad. C, yes, okay, we're good. Now we have N, I, X, D, D, and E. Okay, so we have J again. Is it indirect or immediate? No. No, it's neither one. So neither one. Now then, the X, D, D, E, well, the X, no. Base relative. Well, that's impossible because it's a backward branch. Base can't go backwards. PC relative can go either direction, but only PC relative. So the base is a non-starter, PC, and of course then there's no plus in front of the J, so that is a zero. Questions? Okay. So we have 3F9. Tell me, wrong. 3F2. All right, now we need the three-digit offset. So destination, it 
again. What's the address of again? 1004. Minus source plus 3. Well, what's the address of the source? 100A, correct? Yep. Plus 3 is D. So this, you guys should be able to do these simple hex subtractions. I expect that you would be able to do this. So you borrow 16, and you've got 4, that's 20, right? 16 and 4 is 20. Minus 13 is 7. Does everybody see this? I mean, you should have learned this in 237. Maybe you forgot, but you still know how to do it. You might practice a little bit if, if you're uncertain. But these, I will never ask you really hard, nasty numbers to do. It's always going to be something like this that's straightforward. Of course, we cancel. You can always borrow off the left end. So, we have 3F2, well, F7. What number is FF7? Yeah. Well, an easy way to think of this is this plus what would get you zero. This plus what would get you zero. Well, 9 and 7 is 16. Right? This is minus 9. This says go back 9 bytes. So I think asking you to encode something, go back 9 bytes, is a fair question. But a lot of you missed it. Do you have questions about how this works? Anybody? Okay. You just kind of, you know, I have this impression. I talked to a few of you, and some of you said, oh, wow, that test went really well. It's a very fair test. It was great. And that same student, I looked at the grades, and it's like 65%. Whoops. How does a student walk out of a test thinking he did really well and do so poorly? I don't have an answer to that question. <laughs> I wish I did. Anyway. All right, so where points got missed? Alpha, word one. Should there be anything in that middle column? Yes. yes. Zero, zero. Zero, 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 one. Precisely six digits, three lines. What about beta? Nothing. A bar, a line, just flight, but nothing. It generates no object or machine code. Gamma. Now, I have to tell you, somebody did, didn't actually do it. Yes, gamma. And if you saw little markings, tear stains on your paper, you know why. <laughs> that was me. <laughs> That's cool. And then the last one, zero 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 A. But nothing for end, nothing for beta, nothing for prog or begin. So that was your exam. Questions about this? Anybody? All right, if I have made a mistake somewhere, or I hope not, I try to be careful. If I have, please call it to my attention. If I made a mistake, then you should get your points. Um, Midterm two will probably be, I'm guessing, but I would say probably the week after Thanksgiving. Just so you can do a heads up. And it will be a whole bunch about macros. And some portions of this uh, be done. That's quite all right. You're special. 
My mom says that too. Uh, yeah. You've saved me a lot of effort in 237. You can interrupt me anytime. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Okay. So, the assignment is fairly easy to describe, so I'm not going to start the projector up. It's due Monday, November 14th. We've got two weeks to do it. Two weeks to do it, which means get cracking on this thing. So this is not hard, hard. You know what? The parsing was harder that you've already done. That was messier. By the way, I posted the, the program that tripped you guys up on program one. It's online. So those of you that don't know why you got the results you did, run that program with yours. What I actually did was I took one of the CS237 students, Program 1. I took someone that got 100% on the project and used their program to test your parser. And so if it tripped up, then the grade was important. But you can see what happened if you use that as the, to test your response. OK, so Program 2. This is the first iteration of the macro processor or preprocessor. What's the difference? Well, macro preprocessor means that it is run first and then the assembler runs. And that's technically correct in the environment we have for 237. However, macro processors are also part of compilers, and they're not a separate step. So I'm kind of using those terms interchangeably. But at any rate, you can run the macro preprocessor that is installed on Edoras and test your programs with it to see if you get the right behavior. And it's not in the path. So you will have to do this and do tell the directions. DSVC. Which is the name of the simulator we use. Then, macro pre macro pp file. So, what that will do is generate an SD file that has the macro expansion in it. Now, this is the final phase, right? So, you can use that to see what you're supposed to have. For this iteration, though, we're just going to do the macro definition. So there's two parts to this. The first part is the macro definitions. And the macro definitions, there's an example here. And essentially, you have a label and then you turn macro. So I have this one and the assignment to the other. Then you have all of the instructions, and you terminate this with end yeah. So that defines a macro. So these are your things you're going to look for when you run your program. And by the way, this now will have a main method in it, so there is not a driver this time. This will be a main method in your program. When you find the label or the definition here, macro, in the opcode field, then you remove it. This is the macro definition thing. You pull this out. And it's no longer in the user source code. You yank it out, and you use this to populate in the next phase, which will be the expansion. So then, right now, it doesn't matter what's in between, you yank it out. You're going to have to replace, so the line should parse in the same fashion, but you're going to have to make some changes. Part of this, these changes are by design. That very often when you write software, you have to come back and change things. So the macros work as follows. There are some special symbols, they have the backslash in front of them. Backslash F is the sign. I'm sorry. The 
this is the label. So all of the labels need to end with backslash at. And the backslash at is a replaceable number. So say I call a macro, let's just say over here I have a label called convert. Convert, that's the name of my label. Alright, if I call this macro, this will be inserted in the code in place of the macro call. If that happens and I have this macro more than one time, then convert will be in the source code more than one time. You can't have that. Each label can only be defined once. So what you do when you write the code is you put the backslash at here. And then what the macro preprocessor, i.e. your program will do during expansion, is it will do convert zero. Convert one. Convert two. So these are actual numbers that are going to be allowed in a label that you now have to make sure that you don't reject. But now the different invocations of the macro have different numbers. The first time it's macro, it's convert zero, and then it's convert one, and then two. So you can call the macro 999 times, a thousand times, before you have a name flash. Questions about this? The backslash app goes in front of all the labels in the definition, and they're replaced by the number of the invocation. Okay. Then we have backslash zero, which is the size. And then we have backslash one through nine, and backslash a through z. And these are replaceable parameters. Now I have never seen macro code with the letters, because nine replaceable parameters is a whole lot of parameters. So these are like uh, variables you would pass in parameters to a function. Except the, the cardinal thing to remember here is that the direct and literal substitution. Alright, so here we have our macro question. I'm giving you a sample of what I'm talking about in the So here we have the convert by and then the code has dot backslash zero. DEQ done backslash and very easy. So I'm going to stop here and I want to write down what these become. So, in your code you will say to upper and pass an address register that points to or has the address of the string you want to upper place. That's the idea. So in your source code you would have something like to upper A1. So that's what the programmer wrote, to upper A1. A1 has the address of a null terminated string that is to be uppercased. Now what your macro preprocessor will do is this. Change the code and put a star in front of it to comment it out. Because the CPU doesn't know what a to upper is. So that's not valid machine code. So that gets commented out. And now the instructions appear. 
Confirmed. Zero. Now, uh, two upper dots on test. Dot B. Oh, I don't have a test. I need my backslash one. Okay, test A1 in parentheses, because I got backside 1 in parentheses. Direct literal substitution. B2 done. Zero, zero, zero. Compare. Immediate dot B. Immediate. A backslash one. B L T increment. Zero. And then we have the Z here. It's zero. B. C. So this is what the macroprocessor actually does. So you take a line, and where there's a backslash something, you replace it with these parameters. Backslash 1, OK, this is the first parameter, it's A1. Does everybody see this? Dot B, well, that's the 0. And then these at signs go on the end of the label so that you have unique numbers for each indication. So what are you doing in your first pass? You are going to process all of the macro definitions, which means you will remove them. They can't stay there. You're going to remove them from the source code file and store them in such a way that you can do this direct literal substitution in the next program, in the next assignment. Questions? Yes. Are we using the file parts? Yes, use your file parts. You're going to do line at a time. And if the op code is macro, then you yank it out. You go until you hit end in and you just remove it. Yes. So each line of code, of course, is stored in memory. I would have a macro vector. I would have a different vector for the macro. You can store them in a different place, and it gives you a great deal of freedom here. There's no .h file in this assignment. There's only the requirement that you have one specific public method, which is print macros, which will dump what you have stored. So then I can run it and look and make sure that you have the correct you have actually grabbed and stored the macros in the files. So the delimiters are super easy here. You've already solved the problem of position. If the opcode field says macro, that starts it. You yank that line out and go tell the opcode field has end in. That's your macro. You store each line and you have don't have comments. The comments are unimportant. But you have label, op 